Welcome. Uh, I'm David Kennedy, the former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West, and we are pleased to be collaborating with the History Department in this uh, series of lectures on Western history. And I want to thank uh, Catherine Laverius, where are you? I always lose track of you in the crowd, for being my partner at the other end of this uh, collaboration. There will be three more of these uh, lectures this academic year, and as some of you who were here on the last occasion have heard me say before, our purpose is to bring to this community some of the richness and dynamism in the broader field of Western history, broadly construed. Uh, the focus on this region has long been uh, in this department's culture, going back at least as far as Edgar Eugene Robinson, who taught here for virtually his entire career. He was a former student of Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, Don Fehrenbacher taught courses here for years on the, on the history of California. David Potter uh, wrote a lot about the Oregon Trail. And of course, more recently, Richard White uh, has been our uh, pillar of the Western history offerings here. Uh, the, the broad category of Western history, of course, embraces a lot of other topics, including environmental, immigration, technology, federalism, water, energy, and Native American history, which we'll hear more about in just a moment or so. And if you wanted any uh, index <coughs> of how much appetite there is in this community for this general subject, uh, I submit to you that uh, tonight we'll begin teaching a course on Western history, well, on the West, I should say, more broadly, in the Continuing Studies program, and about 450 people have enrolled for that course. So we think we're doing a service uh, to this community to bring focused and high quality scholarly discussion to this general topic. So our speaker uh, this afternoon or this evening is uh, Claudio Sant. He's yet another son of the West, born in San Francisco, which he's taken the liberty of highlighting on the map, I see. Uh, Claudio was a, a undergraduate at Columbia, took his PhD at uh, Duke University. He's the author of several works, uh, mostly concerned with the with Native American history, and more particularly, I would say, the interaction of Native American communities with the federal government. Uh, his most recent book is entitled Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory, published in 2020, and a winner of the Bancroft Prize, congratulations, in 2021. And I'm sure I speak for everybody in this room when I say, uh, how do you get one of those? <laughs> Uh, Claudio is also the creator of something called the Invasion of America, which is an interactive map that documents the long and sorry history of land sessions and seizures uh, by the larger dominant white settler society and indigenous peoples. And today he's going to be talking to us about the land beneath our feet, mapping indigenous peoples in North America. Claudio, welcome to Stanford. Thank you all for coming out. Um, we've had a break in the rain for at least a few hours. <laughs> um, I think it's going to start raining again during this lecture, so I hope you all brought your umbrellas. Um, so we're, I'm starting this lecture here in Chateauroya Uihe. Um, you're not in the wrong lecture. We're going to wend our way westwards. We'll spend most of our time in western, northwestern Georgia that used to be the west from the perspective of British colonists. Uh, but I promise you by the end we will get all the way out to the far west where we are today. So um, just to orient you, you all know where San Francisco is. And, um, and this is Chateauroya Uihe. It's a, a mid-sized town. Uh, it's on the present day border of, of Hungary and Slovakia. And um, my grandparents were born here um, many decades ago. My grandmother immigrated to the US in the early 20th century. My grandfather, Zoltan, emigrated much later in um, December of 1937 when he managed to escape Hungary. And he then joined my grandmother in, in Cleveland. So several years ago, I inherited his correspondence with his parents and his siblings in Chateauroya Uihe. And um, so that's my grandfather, and you can see his two sisters, his father, his brother, and um, his father's second wife. Um, his mother had died in childbirth. So um, these letters 
run through 1943, and they end shortly before Hungarian police forced Zoltan's family and other Jews into a hastily constructed ghetto and then shipped them to their deaths in Auschwitz. In the correspondence, my grandfather and his brother and sisters exchange baby photos, including one of my father, who was born in July of 1940. This was just a few weeks before county officials in Chateau Uihe passed a series of laws that virtually made it impossible for Jews to make a living in Hungary, not only to make a living, but even to buy the basics like uh, fuel to warm your house in the winter. So reading through this correspondence, there are these complaints and the um, winter of um, 41 and 42 that they're freezing to death and you know, pl please send help. As conditions for Jews worsened then the letters from Hungary became increasingly desperate until they came to a halt uh, right at the end of 1943. So the correspondence prompted me to read more broadly about the history of deportations in the 20th century and then to reconsider the deportation that occurred closer to my current home in Athens, Georgia in the 1830s. So this is what we commonly call Indian removal. In my recent book, Unworthy Republic, I reconsider what we call Indian removal in, in the context of this larger history of state-sponsored forced migrations. And I started simply by rethinking the words that we use to describe this policy to deport 80,000 Native Americans from their homelands. In essence, the goal of the policy was to remove every single Native person from their homelands east of the Mississippi River and to move them into the segregated ter territory that was then called Indian Territory. It's now called Oklahoma. So I just started creating a, a list of words that we use to talk about this policy and the historiography and then kind of imagining how we might reconsider the terminology. And I'll just give you a couple of obvious examples. Indian, uh, I don't use the term Indian in the book because it has so many layers of uh, positive and negative connotations which are so difficult for us to escape from. So instead of writing about Indians, I write about individuals or people or men or women or Cherokees or Choctaws or victims or deportees. Uh, I don't use the word warrior for obvious reasons. I, I call these people men or um, fathers, if that were the case, or resistors or partisans. Uh, on, on the other side, I don't refer to the Georgia militia. I call them a paramilitary organization, which is really what they were. That's how they functioned in the 1830s. And then, like so many other scholars, I don't use the word plantation. Instead, I refer to slave labor camps. And most importantly, I don't call this policy Indian removal. That's a term that was coined by the proponents of this policy in the late 1820s. So instead I call it a deportation, an expulsion, and at certain times and places I call it an extermination. And all of these terms uh, were used at the time by different people in different places. Because of how we've written about this massive state-sponsored expulsion in the 1830s, we've not been able to see the parallels and connections to other mass deportations in the 19th and 20th centuries, including those in World War II. So as a result, America remains the exceptional nation. It's unblemished by state-building crimes, by the state-building crimes that tarnish the history, the histories of other nations. So since the publication of Unworthy Republic in 2020, I've continued to think about the parallels, and especially in the ways that we remember these events. In Chateau Uihe today, there's no sign anywhere that my grandfather's family lived here until they were deported in the spring of 1944, or that my grandmother's family lived here until they were likewise deported. And in fact, there's no official marker anywhere in Chateau Uihe, that the state sent a third of the town's residents to their death. 
except for this small sign, which is on a rock in the train station. Of course, this is where they were packed onto cattle cars and sent to Auschwitz. And this is written in a few different languages. It's in Slovak and Hungarian and Hebrew, and it says simply, in memory of the deported Jews from Zemplin County and Chateauroya Uihe. So the erasure is nearly complete. This is the spectacular synagogue that my grandfather and grandmother attended in Chateauroya Uihe. After the war, the synagogue was used as a warehouse. And then in 1966, the building was transformed almost beyond recognition. It became a furniture store. And then as I found it last year, it was turned into a shopping center. So I say it's almost unrecognizable. You know, underscore almost because bizarrely, and I don't really understand why, the, you can see the pattern of the windows um, mimics the pattern of the windows in the original synagogue, and even the contours of the facade um, kind of resemble the original synagogue. So this is the pattern in Chateauroya Uihe. Today the streetscape uh, has echoes of the past. There's these, there are resonances, but the people are gone, and there are no markers to them. So this is, um, that's my grandfather's sister, my, um, my dad's cousins, and, you know, and, and I show this to you here because it's eerie, well, at least I found it eerie, that, you know, the, like the downspout um, here in the gutter, you know, you can see it, exa it's exactly the same, and even to the level, of, you probably can't make this out, but there are a couple of um, telephone wires that cross the street at an angle here, and um, you know, even this summer, the same wires are crossing the street in the same place. So there are these echoes, resemblances, but, but no sign of any people, no marker uh, about what happened to a third of the town's residents. And in fact, the city government, rather than considering how to memorialize the deported, has invested its time and resources in the development of a water park and a funicular. One local historian named Chaba Chorba observes that the thousands of visitors to the water park have little interest in the past. As he writes, quote, it's more interesting and fun to go to the mountains. Susan Nyman and others have compared memory culture in Germany and in the United States. And most of these comparisons, including Clint Smith's recent book and his even more recent article in The Atlantic, which some of you may have seen, most of these works focus on slavery in the United States um, and discuss the differences in how Germans are coming to terms um, with their past in World War II and how the United States has failed or is struggling to do so um, regarding slavery. I'm interested in the indigenous side of the story and especially in how deported and murdered people were erased from the landscape or how they might be made present as part of a culture of memory. Early in the 1990s, the German artist Gunter Demnig launched, launched a project to install stumbling stones. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Most of these are in the sidewalks of Berlin. Each one of these stones commemorates a victim, someone who was deported at their former houses. So you can see Demnig here installing four stones, one stone um, for one individual, and then you can see them kind of embedded in the street and people walking by. The stones are simple. They are made of concrete with a brass plate. Each one is etched with a person's name and fate. So murdered in Theresienstadt and Auschwitz and Treblinka and so on. There are now nearly 100,000 of these stumbling stones embedded in sidewalks throughout Europe. So the erasure of deported peoples from Chateau Royuihe and, and from Europe more generally 
And the efforts of artists, scholars, and activists to reverse this erasure prompted me to think more about the parallels in my home state, in Georgia, and in the United States, especially in the fast-growing sprawl of North Atlanta and in the northern part of the state. And for those of you um, unfamiliar with Georgia, so the northern part of the state uh, once belonged to the Cherokees. Um, a large swath of what used to be the Cherokee Nation is now represented by Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, but the absence of Cherokees in Georgia is, is almost complete. Uh, and and uh, people go about their business with no sense that only, uh, you know, 100, 200, almost 200 years ago, uh, people were deported from this part uh, of the state. As Chaba Chorba might say, it's more fun to go to the North Georgia mountains than it is to dwell on the state building crimes of earlier generations. So last year, with the support of the Guggenheim Foundation, I launched a project called The Land Beneath Our Feet to map in depth and detail the indigenous families who lost their homes in the 1830s to create a virtual representation of the Cherokee Nation just before the United States drove its 16,000 citizens off their farms and across the Mississippi River. Online mapping admittedly lacks the immediacy of stumbling stones. It cannot interrupt the daily routines of pedestrians in the same way. But it has the advantage of representing entire communities and of showing a richer and more informative portrait of the deported. Moreover, while stumbling stones are embedded in urban sidewalks, the home sites, home sites of deported Cherokees often sit on private lands in rural areas without the foot traffic of a busy Berlin street. So even if you could put up some sort of um, stumbling stone or something equivalent, uh, if you marked a location of where someone once lived, uh, first of all, it would be difficult because it's often privately owned, but even if you could put something up, no one would see it except the farmer who might occasionally plow the field. So this project relies on a remarkable set of records that make the Cherokees perhaps the best documented people in the entire world in the 1830s. This is a testament to the imperial ambitions of the um, pathetically small federal government in the 1830s. There were 10,000 employees, but 7,000 of them worked for the post office. Um, but um, um, that didn't stop them. They produced thousands and thousands of rec records. They documented you know, everything that they could, and they, they documented it um, two times and then three times, and all of these volumes are crumbling today in the National Archives. So in 1835, federal officers conducted a census of Cherokee households. They counted the number of acres under cultivation and bushels of corn and wheat that had been harvested. They evaluated the English proficiency of the residents. They identified specific acquired skills, such as spinning, weaving, and smithing, what they called civilization. A year later, US agents known as valuators visit, visited each Cherokee homestead and cataloged every single cabin, corn crib, barn, smokehouse, well. Uh, valuators noted whether the logs were round, uh, hewn, or sculpt, that is, whether they had the bark removed. They tallied the number of windows. They described the chimneys, how the chimneys were constructed. They evaluated the type of roofing. They measured the dimensions of each building. It's quite extraordinary. So it's um, you know, somewhat akin to when um, we buy or sell a house today, and the appraiser comes out and describes uh, the property in detail. Not only that, they counted the number of apple, peach, pawpaw, and cherry trees. They assessed each acre 
of farmland. They appraised the fertility of the soil and they described the quality of the fencing. So let me just give you uh, two examples. And I should say, so these evaluators, there were about maybe 10 or 12 different evaluators who were working in the Cherokee Nation. So this spreads over what is present day North Georgia, Western North Carolina, um, Northern Alabama, and Eastern Tennessee. <clears throat> so these evaluators were sent out. Um, some did better jobs than others. So some of the books have more detail than others. But even the ones that aren't that deal, detailed are really quite extraordinary. Uh, so, so this is a single page of um, one of these valuation books, and there are two people listed on it. This is Guts, um, as he was called in English, who lived near Cedartown. And here is a man named Ben Tiski who lived on the uh, Ustanala River. So this is um, not far from Rome, Georgia. Again, this is Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. And you can just see what they describe here. His dwelling house, 18, well, here, I actually blew it up, if you can see that. Um, his dwelling house, 18 by 20 feet, a story and a half high. There's a piazza, as so many Cherokees traditionally did, in front of the house. Floor above and below, good, good quality. There's a chimney. He didn't give us more details in this case about the chimney. This is how much the um, evaluator thought that the property was worth. A crook house, square footage, a crib, that is a corn crib, a stable, one house not furnished, two gates, a field of 10 acres, a two acre lot, 190 peach trees, um, and 61 apple trees. I'll say more about the fruit trees in a minute. Um, and then at the bottom it says, Ben, not at home, his wife willing to move when the balance of the tribe Moves. So this was, this record is from um, 1836, so just a couple years before they were forced west at gunpoint. And I'll just give you one more example. So this is now the Chattooga River. So this is eastern Alabama, just across the border from Georgia. And again, there are two valuations here. There's uh, Sally Bennett, described as a full-blood Cherokee and white tobacco, also described as a full-blood Cherokee. And you can see he had one house, 12 by 14 feet, <clears throat> round logs that were daubed, that is uh, kind of plastered with a mixture of mud and clay. Um, a board roof, so that's a big deal, because you know, basically having a plank instead of a log, it was a lot more labor and more expensive. A board roof, a board loft, a board door and shutter, a dirt floor, wooden chimney. So here he describes the specifics of the chimney with a rock back, hearth, and jams. Uh, another house, 12 by 12 feet, round logs, this time uncovered, that is not daubed, dirt floor. Um, yet another house with round logs and so on and so on, a corn crib made of split timber, a punch and floor, so the logs are split, you know, so they're walking on the flat part. Um, and again, these 83 peach trees, 14 acres in one field, Coosa bottom land. So that's very uh, valuable land. And this gives you a sense of why planters were so eager to deport these people, because this is some of the most, it's perfect for growing cotton, some of the most valuable agricultural land in the entire world at the time. Um, and then we see 25 fruit trees that were bearing fruit. So they added up the total. Um, so as you can see, and it's, it's ex extraordinary information to be able to know this about indigenous families in the 1830s. So, yes? What was the purpose of citing the that value? Were they compensated with this? Yeah, so, right, great question. So the this is all a result of the Treaty of New Echota in 1835, which is the removal treaty, extraordinarily controversial treaty, in which um, basically there was a, a kind of rump government or coup. <laughs> um, people, the principal chief did not sign this treaty, but the United States got together a group of Cherokees who did sign it. Um, and, um, and the United States then pretended that this was a, a legitimate treaty. But by the terms of the treaty, the United States was supposed to send out valuators 
and um, assess, appraise the value of all of this property and then compensate Cherokees. Now, that gets into this question, well, did, were they really compensated? And that's actually, there's no simple answer to that because um, um, on one side of the balance sheet were all of the credits and then there were all the debits on the other side. So there were thousands and thousands of merchants who then went to Indian agents and said, so and so, white tobacco owes me X, Y, and Z, and that would be subtracted from the amount that white tobacco was to receive. Um, were those valid debts? We can't know, but almost certainly not. Um, and then on top of that, they were not compensated until they went west, so that this was a, a form of you know, this kind of economic pressure. They wouldn't receive their money unless they went west. And then what, did they what currency did they receive their money in? These are questions we don't really know. Um, but, uh, but we do know that some of them received their compensation in, current, in paper money that was virtually worthless. Um, so, so yeah, short answer, the treaty um, obligated the federal government to do this. So we've ent entered all of this data into a database. I say we because I didn't do all of this. I, um, I had um, graduate students, uh, graduate student workers who, who did a lot of the work um, for me. Um, but there's still um, yet another set of revealing records that we're now working with. Because in 1838, another team of federal agents moved through the Cherokee Nation and this time to enumerate all personal property. So all of those goods that were inside these houses, and Cherokees were presented with this very difficult question, what, you know, what do you bring with you? You're, you have to carry, you can only carry so many objects, what's going to turn into a burden on your journey west or what is going to turn out to be essential when you get to this distant place called Indian Territory. Um, and of course, they had to guess. Um, but a lot of the property then was left behind. And so this team of federal agents went out and once again enumerated all of the personal property and then, um, and then auctioned it off to white citizens in Georgia. So we have all of those records, pots, plows, bags of dried fruit, fiddles, fishing hooks, canoes, and so on and so on. So I'll just, again, I'll just give you a couple of examples. So this is um, a, a man named George Chicken who lived in Murray County in Georgia at a Cherokee town called Rabbit Trap. So this is, near Dalton, Georgia. It's, um, you probably don't know Dalton, but it's, um, it calls itself the carpet capital of the world. Um, so George Chicken owned a mare and a pony. So, and, so these are the people who bought the property. And this is what they paid for it. Uh, a pony, a colt, a lot of old plunder, crockery, cotton, iron tools, chisel, gouge, deerskin, um, an old rattle, a sheep, a sow and pigs, a table, a lot of chickens, an earthen dish, and a pot. And one more quick example. So this is uh, a man named Biter who lived on um, Kohala Creek, which is east of present-day Chattanooga, Tennessee. So he had a, a heifer, a crop of corn, a plows, a basket, <clears throat> table, hogs, chairs, old tools, a pair of traces, so for attaching a draft animal to a plow, cotton wheel. So this is a guy, you know, the Indian agent would have been happy with this guy because he was civilized, right? He had, he had a plow and a cotton wheel and tools then to operate um, his wheel, um, a pot. Um, but then more traditionally, he had, a powder, uh, he had three blow guns, right, a traditional uh, Cherokee implement, and, and then some corn. So you can see the total here. So all of this property then was auctioned off. And we are putting all of this 
data into the database. Um, and down the road, I, I think it would also be fun to link these folks you know, to the census in 1840 and 1850. Um, and I bet that some of these objects are today family heirlooms that uh, Georgia families own. And, you know, teaching in Georgia, I, every semester I get students who come up and say, well, my, you know, great, great, great whomever won the Georgia lottery in 1832 and moved into the Cherokee Nation, so on and so on. Sometimes they say they're part Cherokee too, which is sometimes true and more often not. So, um, so the database is fully searchable, um, and I just want to show you this picture. So, I am not. Um, so, I when I dreamed of this project, I, I um, kicked around and asked people how this might be built, what platform could I use. Um, and I wanted this to be accessible to the public. It's very much a public project. Um, and so I settled on Drupal, and I didn't know anything about Drupal, so I did a kind of just self-taught crash course, which maybe sounds impressive, except I'm a rank amateur. Um, I, you know, I built a database that operates, but I would never want to show it to anybody. I'm showing you a little bit. <laughs> so I, I, I I've paid some professionals to build a site, which will be um, completed very soon in the next few weeks, I hope. Um, and that will be the public site. So this is just kind of the crappy thing that I built, but it gives you a sense of just what's going on here. Um, so these are you know, all of the so-called content types. Um, like So there's, there's basically um, you know, a database for property returns, listing the private property, the purchasers, so all of those Georgia citizens who bought the stuff, um, and then the valuations themselves. And so this, this is just a page showing us um, the people. Um, and there are, I think there are 10, there should be about 10 entries here. And you know, over 400 pages. So there are over 4,000 homesteads. I don't remember the exact, it's close to 4,200 homesteads. Um, and, and that's obviously, um, obviously more than one person lived in each homestead. So that's, uh, you know, some homesteads were certainly missed, but this is a fairly complete um, representation of the Cherokee Nation in the 1830s. But what's just cool about this page is you can, well, maybe you can see, some of the records actually have the name in English and then also in the Cherokee syllabary, which is really quite extraordinary. And so I partnered with um, Patrick Del Perchio at the University of Oklahoma, who's an expert in the syllabary, and he was able to transcribe all of that. And so we got to put that into the database. And so you can see Woman Killer, um, uh, his name is in the Cherokee syllabary, and then Woodcock. So there are two entries here for Woodcock, but that's simply that's the same person, more than you need to know, but you know, here's the ID number. That's the same person who owned two different properties. Um, but you can see Woodcock's name in the syllabary, and then down at the bottom, um, Wyaluka, um, his name in the Cherokee syllabary. I've been saying his a lot. Um, as far as the federal government was concerned, the head of the household was the man. But there are a number of women who do appear in this database, but there is this kind of um, uh, inherent bias uh, to the way that these home, the, the, that the data is recorded. And um, I think it will be possible in many cases to reconstruct those families uh, because there are multiple Cher Cherokee censuses that were taken later post deportation that will um, allow us to say, okay, you know, that, that's why Luca who was deported, and these are the other people who lived in his household. And so that could be a, a yet another kind of stage in this project. So the database is, is of obvious value to scholars, but it's the mapping component that most excites me. Um, and the online version is being built with ArcGIS Online. That's still under construction, so I can't show you that. But what I can do is just show you the images. This is just my desktop version 
of ArcGIS, and that's that's really how I kind of constructed, um, put all the data together because we put everything into the database, and then we had to locate all of the homesteads. And um, I say we, actually, I had to do that, and it was ter drudgery, um, but I did manage to survive and, and get all of these homesteads on here. So, so here you can see the distribution. There's Atlanta, to Athens, where I live now. Um, there are about 3,700 homesteads that are plotted, and that's because in some cases um, more than one homestead is associated with a single point. Because I can't in all cases know with certainty where people were living, and if I didn't know, I didn't want to pretend I knew, so I, you know, one of these points may have two or three homesteads associated with it. Um, the red polygons you see represent the county boundaries in 1836, which was useful to me to try to figure out where people were and where people were living. Um, also very useful, just telling you all this to give you a sense of the process here. These were 1832 surveying plats. In 1832, the Georgia um, claimed sovereignty over the Cherokee Nation actually before that, but in 1832, they sent out these surveyors, intrusively marched through the Cherokee Nation and created these surveys. So I had to georectify all those, and, um, but they have some great information on them. Um, for starters, they have all of these trees, because that's how they define the, the lines. So there's a whole separate project I'm kind of working on with these trees. Um, but but these I've just highlighted in yellow. These are Cherokee homesteads which were marked by the surveyor. So we can know with really a, an extraordinary degree of precision, in this instance at least, where Cherokees were living. So what appeals to me about the mapping is that like stumbling stones, it brings a specificity. This family at this location to histories of Indian removal that are often about unindividuated ethnic groups, such as Cherokees or Creeks or Choctaws. So this is a, a close-up of Dalton, Georgia, and you can see, so that's obviously the current day map, and you can just see where Cherokees were living. But again, if you go to Dalton, Georgia, and you're driving around here, you will have no sense that there was a Cherokee family once living here. So it can tell the folks who are going to Walmart that um, there used to be a Cherokee family. You can name that Cherokee family and you can describe what their home look, looked like. It used to be where the parking lot now is. Or you can tell a homeowner that around the corner um, there was a different family once living here and you can tell this person what happened to that family. Um, you can also say um, you can tell people who are Braves fans, this is Truist Stadium, right here marked in the middle of this circle, the home of the Braves and the infamous Tomahawk Chop. <laughs> I just drew a 12, uh, this is a six mile radius, which I drew, or 12 mile radius, I'm sorry, that I drew around the stadium and you can see these Cherokee families that lived uh, in the shadow of where people perform the, the Tomahawk Chop. So um, I mentioned the trees, and let me just say quickly, so this is a map of the distribution of apple trees. There were 36,000 apple trees that were enumerated in the Cherokee Nation, um, which is really fascinating. Um, you know, wh where were they grown? Who grew them and what quantities? These are all questions that we can answer. But there's a larger story here that I'm working with. Uh, I'm working with a colleague on because uh, immediately after the Cherokees were deported, southern orchardists went into the Cherokee Nation. They combed the Cherokee Nation for valuable apple varieties, and they took um, clippings or scions and took them back and started to cultivate them. So it's our... Um, it's our belief that a lot of the southern apple varieties that we currently have are descended from these Cherokee apples. 
and in the context of global warming, by the way, these apple varieties are becoming increasingly important to us today. So, you know, today we would call this a form of intellectual property theft. We could also think of it as horticultural imperialism. Um, but not only was all of this lost to the Cherokees, even if they were compensated, I would say 90% of the time they weren't, they were not, but even if they were compensated, they were sent out to a place where even if they brought a scion with them, uh, you can't bring a seed because um, apples, the, you know, the, the, if you want the same kind of fruit as the parent tree, you have to take a clipping and graft it. Um, but they were sent out to Oklahoma and had to start all over again, right? People who had spent generations cultivating these apple varieties then had to start all over again. So that was all lost to them. Um, there were even more peaches. There were something like 140,000 peach trees in the Cherokee Nation. Georgia's the peach state today. Um, so I just mapped. So the red just represents where the apples were grown. And then the, I don't know if that's a peach color, but I tried. Um, you know, that represents where the, the peaches were grown. So that's a whole other kind of aside, but I think interesting story. So. Um, with the photographer Andrew Zawaki, I recently began to visit these locations. I want to also include photographs on the website when it's completed. So um, a few weeks ago, we were out in Cobb County and, so, and visited a number of these sites. And I'll show you just a couple of pictures. We started with Tenwa's house, who lived here, right near the Cobb County Airport. Um, Tenwa had 100 peach and apple trees, 18 acres cleared and fenced. He owned a house, a smokehouse, a corn crib, and a stable. Um, and this is what we found nearby today. And I say nearby because um, even on the map that I showed you, we scattered the points by um, up to a quarter of a mile because we cannot reveal some, if we do reveal the exact locations of these sites, it will encourage looters to go. And some of these sites are, are still quite sensitive. Most aren't, but some are. And so, but this was, is within about a quarter mile of where we suspect that Tenwa lived. Um, then we headed uh, northeast up to Owl's house. Owl lived here with his mother. They had two different fields under cultivation, totaling about 25 acres. Um, they also had peach and apple trees, 150 of them. And, and there we found this um, concrete plant. We drove up there, by the way, and there were lots of signs saying, don't enter, you'll be prosecuted. We drove up and talked to the foreman who seemed amused that we were interested at all in this place. And then astoundingly, he just let us walk around, <laughs> which seemed insane to me, but we were happy to get the photos. Um, we um, then moved on to Anna Waka's house, still traveling northeast, and found this bizarre site. This is a subdivision in Cobb County, and there was this um, string of hammocks and this bizarre thing that looks like a, <laughs> a coffin. It's, I think it's a barbecue grill that had been covered for the winter. So not all of these homesteads are now covered with asphalt, um, and not all of them sit beneath suburban sprawl. On a separate trip, we were um, further to the northeast, up here, as you can see. Um, and there, we visited um, the site of Rising Fawn's house. Rising Fawn um, lived on Setting Down River. There were a number of Cherokee residences on, on, on this river. And then we also visited the residents of um, his mother, a woman named Elizabeth Welch, who belonged to a uh, very influential Cherokee family. Um, and there, amazingly, we found this sign. <laughs> um, the irony is obvious. Um, so we, you know, we, we were just driving here kind of blindly. I had my you know, GPS map. We got here, and I, I thought it would be down here. And we found this sign that says, posted this property patrolled by off-duty police officers, surveillance cameras used on property, trespassers will be prosecuted. 
So, um, so that's a whole other part of the project is to document these sites today. Um, so the installation of Stumbling Stones is a community project. These Stumbling Stones that are in Berlin and other cities in Europe, this, these are a result of a community coming together and deciding that it wants to commemorate the location um, or commemorate someone who was deported at the site of their last known residence. So with this project, I've reached out to the Katua Preservation Program. Um, it's a Cherokee, Eastern Band Cherokee organization. They run a Cherokee Language Immersion School. I've talked to the Eastern Band Historic Preservation Office, um, and also to the Remember the Removal Cycling Group, my favorite, because it brings together two of my passions, Native American history and cycling. Um, this is a really great project, though. They have a kind of year-long educational project about, about deportation and the Trail of Tears, and then they cycle a part of the Trail of Tears each year. So, um, so my intention is to add an additional content type, as it's called in Drupal, um, that would only be accessible to Cherokee citizens. And so Cherokee students and others would be able to add biographical information to crowdsource, in other words, information about these families. And then if they so chose, they could promote this information, that is, display it to the general Public. And at a later stage of the project, I also imagine that Cherokees might open discussions with communities in Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, and North Carolina, and place at least some physical markers in some of these towns um, in what used to be the Cherokee Nation. Um, so I don't want to talk too much longer, but I do want to um, describe a second related project briefly that also uses mapping to help us reimagine the history of the continent. Um, this project tells us who lived where and when with an unusual degree of specificity. I have another project called Mapping the People of, of Early America that takes a small scale view of the continent's history. And the goal of this project is to create an online interactive time-lapse map of the African indigenous and European populations in North America between 1500 and 1800, which is um, a fool's errand. Admittedly, never should have taken it on, um, but I'm too far into it to quit at this point. Uh, so I started this project many years ago, realizing that the maps that we had that showed the population of early America were partial in both senses of the word. And they were distorting how we, that is professional historians and the general public, envisioned the history of the continent. And that's because we only, um, for these kind of large scale, well, small scale maps, but maps that are showing uh, large portions of the continent, we really have two sources. One are these, the freeze maps per, um, created by the, the chief cartographer in the, in the National Ar Archives in the 1940s. He produced these maps, we still use these today, beginning in 1825 and ending in 1790. Here's just a close-up. There's one point for every 200 people. There are obvious problems with this. Um, it doesn't distinguish between Africans and Europeans. It doesn't include um, present-day Canada. It doesn't include anything west of the Mississippi River. It doesn't include indigenous people. And yet, this is still our chief source for trying to map where people lived. Our other source is the US Census, but that doesn't start till 1790. It has the advantage in that, uh, that it distinguishes between enslaved and free people, but it doesn't include indigenous people. It obviously doesn't include Canada. It doesn't include anything in the West. So all kinds of problems with this data. And the result is that we get maps like this. And you can't blame the historians because they can't do any better. As we get these maps say, representing the continent in 1500 and putting up these ethnonyms, kind of a random, who knows how they choose which ethnonym to put on the map. But it doesn't give you really a sense of who lived where and how many people were living there. Um, elsewhere in textbooks, you'll find maps like this. So th this is clearly based on the freeze maps, um, showing us the area 
settled in 1650 and then in 1700, so you get a sense of this expansion. But you don't get a sense. This is the, the critical moment in the Chesapeake when slavery is introduced and the population begins to expand, but you can't tell it from this map. There's no distinction between enslaved and free people or, or Africans and Europeans. Or you get um, maps that look like this. So uh, this is another popular textbook. So this is showing us areas that are settled in 1720 and then 1760 and then 1770 to 1790 and then 1800 to 1820 um, and then 1830. So these are based on the census. These are based on the freeze maps. So I set out to try to rectify this. Again, I, said, I admitted it was stupid. Um, and you'll see why. I, I, so I, the first thing I did was create this massive spreadsheet. Um, I put every county and parish in um, every British colony in every decade between 15, well, between 1600 and, and 1800. And I just started filling in numbers when and where I could find them. And a lot of the data is just projected. So I might know the number in 1700, I might know another number in 1740, and then I just had to, I just assumed a linear um, increase, um, which obviously it wasn't, but I, but I can't do any better than that. And this just gives you a kind of a sense of the close-up um, uh, of the spreadsheet. Um, so this project is still in the works, um, but it's got to be finished this spring because that's when I promised the, the NEH, um, and it will be finished. But so this is just a map that I exported from, desk, from my desktop. So there's nothing fancy about this, but I just wanted to show you. This is at least the colonial population. Starts here in St. Augustine in um, 1565, and then Santa Fe. Each blue dot represents 200 colonists. Each red dot represents 200 African peoples. Sometimes these dots are on top of each other at this scale, so you know you, they're, they're, they're red dots underneath these blue dots here. But you can see um, how pressed the population is along the coast, and then now we'll start to see the expansion of the enslaved population in the Chesapeake and the Carolina Low Country, the famous black majority of this part of the country. Um, the pop colonial population in present-day New Mexico, and then finally, right at the end of the 18th century, you start to get a population, a colonial population in, along the coast in California, and, and even the population of Russians in the Aleutian Islands. So um, it's a crude animation here, but it shows that, um, it, I think it powerfully illustrates the colonization of the continent, um, but also that most of the continent was indigenous. So this map starts in 1785, and you can, you can see just how much, even at this late date, this continent was indigenous. Um, the other thing it shows, like here I've zoomed in, so this is 1770. You know, again, the black majority, the heavy African population in the Carolina Low Country and in the Chesapeake region in the era of the American Revolution. So what's extraordinary, at least to me, about this is that um, these visualizations are so powerful, and yet you are in a very select group because we've never been able to visualize this before. This is the first time, amazingly, that there is a map. Um, eventually, when we finish with this, there'll be one point for every single person. Um, and we've never really visualized this. There are um, some large-scale maps, obviously, that historians have produced about certain times and places. But to see the movement across the whole continent, we've never been able to visualize it in this way. Um, so that brings us to the indigenous population. And I'm going to go quickly, because I want to have some time for some questions. But um, what I decided to do was to use a combination of modeling and historical data. And um, to do the modeling, I, the first thing I did was to plot um, 10,000 um, Native American town sites at the time of contact. And when I say time of contact, the time of contact changes, obviously, depending on what place you are in the continent. 
Um, and then, um, and I've collaborated with statisticians and ecologists and GIS specialists. We collected all kinds of environmental data. And we did this stupidly, I'm using this word a lot to, in this part of the talk, at a 90 meter resolution. So we divided the continent north of the Rio Grande into a 90 meter grid and then collected all of this information, which led to all kinds of problems. Um, First of all, it's hard to find. Then we, when we were modeling, we found we needed the same data south of the Rio Grande. And then it was difficult to get data um, that was consonant, um, consonant with each other. Um, and then even then, once we got all of this data together, it was extraordinarily difficult to process. So we wanted to know, for example, what was the distance? This is just showing us the lower 48, obviously. But what was the distance of each one of these 90 meter grids to a water body? And all water bodies, including tiny little streams, you know, and then moving up to, you know, what was the distance to the largest rivers? Um, in the lower 40, and we calculated that. Um, but to tell a computer to do that, so I was, I'm working with Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech Research Institute. Um, their bread and butter is, um, they basically work with DARPA. You know, it's all defense contracting. So they have a lot of computers. Um, and even then, this was gumming up the computer system for days. So we, we had to generalize the data, um, as it turned out. Um, and then I am working with um, John Drake, who's an ecologist who does population modeling. He constructed what, what's called a hurdle model. Basically says, well, where are people mo more likely to live in this continent? Um, this is just a very early example, just the lower 48. You know, and then once you get that, then you can pick a number. Let's say there were 2 million people here in 1,500, or 6 million, or 18 million, and you can distribute them across the continent and kind of visualize where they might have lived. So um, none of this has proven satisfactory to me. When I look at the models, I don't like them. Uh, and you might say, well, that's obvious because we're not accounting for culture in this modeling, right? We're just looking at environmental data and kind of plotting where people are. But, but my goal has never been to rely entirely on modeling. I only want to improve the historical data that we have. So for example, we have historical data and guesstimates, I would call them, for the 10 culture areas that the Smithsonian defines in North America. We have these estimates that we could at least work with um, as a basis for plotting the population. You could take those estimates and you could distribute the population randomly within each of the 10 culture areas, large swaths of the continent. But if you do that, so this is one giant culture area up here. If you do that, the results are, are absurd because in Baffin Island, you get the same distribution of people as you do a thousand miles to the south. Or in the Great Basin, you get the same distribution of people as you do along the Rio Grande. So, well, you know, that's okay. It's kind of interesting, but we can do a lot better, and modeling can help us improve on this representation. You know, we know fewer people lived on the tops of mountains than lived in river valleys. We know that people prefer to live in areas that have some rainfall, or they um, want to live near rivers in most cases. So unfortunately, I can't show you the end results. We're still working on it. Um, but when we're done later this spring, visitors to the website will be able to choose one of three starting populations a low of 1.8 million, a kind of a middle estimate of 6 million, a high estimate of 18 million. That's out of favor now among scholars, but why not show, it may come back in favor. Um, but let's show people what it looks like. What if 18 million people lived here in 1500? What would it look like? Um, you'll be able to visualize that, and you'll be able to move through time decade by decade and watch these populations 
change over time. Um, and just one final but essential point about this project. This is a mock-up, so don't pay attention to the distribution. I just put this together just to purposes of illustration. The map uses three categories of people, indigenous, European, and African. And I'm sure you can all see the problems with that. Um, few individuals identified themselves with those labels. And the categories changed from community to community, and they changed over time. And moreover, after 1,500, an ever-growing number of people were of mixed ancestry. So what on earth are we mapping here in this instance? So this map is in some ways a hybrid. It shows the past, but it uses present-day categories that over time were willed or imposed on people and that are now, that were, and that are now contested. So I'm fully aware of the dangers here of reifying race, but I've chosen to represent populations this way because these categories matter, and they matter today. The dispossession of indigenous Americans is central to the last 500 years. So too is the forced migration of Africans to the Americas. So this map, for the first time, allows us to visualize that historical process. So you know, I mentioned at the outset, if this is a fool's errand, I'm sure that's clear to you by now. Um, I'm still convinced um, that this is an errand worth pursuing. These visualizations convey information so effectively that we use the expression, I see, with little or no awareness that it is a metaphor for understanding. So with this website, for the first time, Americans will see a graphic representation of the multicultural origins of the United States and of the displacement and killing of indigenous Americans. So I'll stop there. Um, I've left, I talked more than I wanted to. Um, but I've left some time for questions, and I hope you have some for me. Thanks. Yeah, so the question was, was I able to go to Oklahoma and do any mapping or photographing? Um, I've been to Oklahoma a lot. Um, not for this project. Um, you know, right now I'm kind of taking advantage of the records that the federal government um, produced. Um, that document its guilt in this process. Um, but one of the things that I love about these sorts of digital projects, there are lots of things I don't love about them, but one of the things I love about them is that you can kind of build onto them. So I mentioned, for example, connecting um, the, the names of Georgia citizens to the census. Um, but the other thing you could do is, um, as you're suggesting, connect this to what happens um, in Indian territory in the 1840s and 1850s and, and after the Civil War as well. And I certainly could imagine doing that down the road. Yes? Um, I was wondering if, whether the, the two projects in some way are different layers and could be used to ask the following question. When you were mapping the Native Americans, were they living with and intermingled with African Americans and whites. And the people that purchased this, were they the neighbors or were they people from other Yeah, wonderful question. Um, and, and absolutely, I mean, that's again what's wonderful about these sorts of GIS projects is that um, layering is clicking a button. Um, and so, yeah, I think there would be, um, um, just for the precisely the reasons you suggest, it would be valuable to do that. And the other thing it's, it would, that is worth doing and that I will be doing is layering this. There's a, um, a kind of related, separate but related project that um, Brett Riggs, um, who's an archaeologist at Western Carolina, is working on. And he's been working um, very closely with Cherokee elders um, for, for a long period and is, is producing a map of um, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, in 
in the Cherokee homeland. So that would be something else that could be put on top of it. But I would love to know this question, who's buying this property? Um, you know, what's, how many slaves do they, uh, I mean, all of these things can be, um, you know, put together fairly easily down the road. Are you working with Brian Stevenson on, you know, he's doing things by county, yeah. and especially if all the way across the southeast? Yeah, I haven't worked with him, um, but there certainly are resonances to the work, um, and I can see down the road kind of bringing these things together. Right now, at this point, I, it's been, um, my focus has been um, pretty tight, I've been pretty tightly focused on trying to get this platform built. Um, and, because, and, and so I haven't even, um, although I've talked to a number of Cherokees about it, I haven't even gone up to the, so the, 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 the um, eastern band, there are two Cherokee, you know, the eastern band in North Carolina, um, has a council of elders, and I've talked about presenting this to them, but I haven't even gotten to that point yet. But I do think that's something that could be done down the road. Um, first and foremost, I want to talk to the council of elders and kind of go out from there. But I do think it has all of these obvious resonances with the work of Brian Stevenson. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, you also have ecological data. Uh, I'm wondering. Is it possible to look at how droughts and uh, changes in the weather affected the migration? Is that something that you plan to do as well with the uh, Yeah, I think it was, um, I, I mentioned Brett Riggs already, but he, he wrote a paper a while back suggesting that it, it was in, va in fact a, a lengthy drought in the late teens and 20s that eventually um, led at least a, um, some portion of the Cherokees to decide that they'd better just cut their losses and move west because they had been weakened by a series of, um, of poor harvests. Um, I think we can look at that. I think the other thing we can do is to, you know, going back to those plots with all of the trees, those can all be plotted so you can kind of recreate what the forest looked like in the 1830s and then you can look at um, how um, not just where Cherokees settled, but how their settlements changed the forest composition. And that's something else I'm working with an ecologist on that project as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually relevant to the whole question of deforestation that starts yes. very early on. And to what extent was it largely the white population, or was it going on already with the uh, Right, right. And, and we know that they changed the forest composition. I mean, that's well documented elsewhere in many ways. But, but, but I mean, what is so extraordinary about this is just that have all this information available to us in the 1830s. Yeah, any, any other questions? Sure. From from this, so you're putting this online. You're saying you said also that some of this information will be sort of kept behind some kind of wall, potentially for members of the Cherokee Nation. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody in, in you know there in, in some of this data also you have the names of people who purchased goods from um, indigenous people from Cherokee people. Have you got any pushback from descendants, perhaps, of these mm -hmm. people who perpetrated the crimes? Well, okay. <laughs> And it ha it's not public yet. So, um, and I guess I wouldn't anticipate um, pushback, but I will tell you an amusing or sad story about this because I did give a talk, um, um, since this is being recorded, so I want to leave out some information, at a place in Georgia um, to a group of non-academic non audience and um, I did, at the end, talk about, I was talking about the deportation of the Cherokees and the role, Georgia was front and center in that, as you probably all know. And I, um, I used the term white supremacy. And there was a near riot, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> and people interrupting me and uh, some people quite angry. Um, and um, so this went back and forth. And finally, I just said, you know, I'm talking about the 1830s when people were being bought and sold in Georgia. 
and the people buying and selling were proud of it, right? I mean, you look at a Georgia newspaper in the 1830s and they're boasting about the slave empire that they're building, which is going to stretch as, you know, as they think to the shores of the Pacific. So yeah, I mean, there's gonna be some pushback. And here is your, I think what you're suggesting is that I'm naming names. Um, you know, who these people are, I don't know yet, and whether, you know, the descendants are going to come back and say that's, you know, unfair, or maybe they'll come back and say thank you for doing that. I had a student last semester who was a descendant of Wilson Lumpkin, who was the, a governor of Georgia and then a congressman. And a, I mean, he was the guy more than anyone, more than Andrew Jackson, who got this Indian Removal Act through Congress and then pushed to get the Cherokees out. And she was delighted with the story, you know, that I was telling about her ancestors. So, so who knows? But we'll see. <laughs> yes. Well, you thanks for a great talk and very fast, it's fascinating. I had quite a kind of follow up on your suggestion about how difficult it is, and when we use these categories, we say black, white, how common, so pretty. Um, so I can understand how you get the data, the blue data, maybe the red data, the green data. I don't understand where you get that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the indigenous population, let's right. say the California. Right. So in, eight, in 18, 1750, right. how do you know what the indigenous population is? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's okay. So great. So I kept using the word, I kept saying fool's errand. <laughs> that, but you're, you're absolutely right to call into question how do we know? Um, and, and there are different ways that we can come up with numbers, but the fact that the estimates vary, you know, I'm just gonna go with 1500, because that's where most of the debate is focused, but the same questions are pertinent in 1790 in California. But um, the estimates vary from today from 1.8 million up to, I, few people would say 18 million anymore, but some still would. Um, that is kind of absurd that it's a multiple from one, whatever that multiple is, you know, nine times, you know, by an estimate of nine, by a, or by a number of nine times, we, we don't really know how many people were living here. Um, so, um, so what I like about the digital project is I can say, I'm not claiming to tell you how many people were living here. I'm just gonna say, okay, let's visualize this. If you, you know, if, if there were one point whatever, eight million people, what would it look like? You know, what would the, this colonial expansion and dispossession look like? How would it unfold? You know, if it were 18 million, what would it look like? You can choose, and the debates, I'm sure, among demographers and historians, it's gonna, ongoing, and it will never be settled, I don't think. Some, there is some um, interesting um, DNA and genetic kind of research, which is now beginning to um, inform these numbers. But when we talk about 1500, the number, you either kind of work backwards from known estimates, and, and um, you know, we can start in 1890 when native peoples were counted and worked backwards, but you can see how flawed that process is because we don't know how many people were killed or died of disease. Um, or you can work from our known estimates, you know, our first historical estimates. That's another way of doing this kind of so-called additive process. So, um, you know, the problem with that is like our first historical, in other words, when some literate person showed up in the upper Missouri River and said, well, I think there were this many people, first, they could be wrong, and second of all, they didn't show up and give us an estimate until the middle, late 18th century, so lots of stuff happened <laughs> since 1500. Disease may have already changed that population significantly, so that just gives you a a brief sense of why these numbers are so fraud and why it's so difficult to know exactly how many people were living here. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Can you say a little bit more about how you teach with these resources or how, I, I know it's early days, but how it's shaping the way that, that you teach this? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and the truth is, is that I haven't yet taught with these. 
Um, so I said, I've, I've taught with this, um, you know, I produced this earlier, I just call it low hanging fruit because I, I, I did this map that just documents every single um, indigenous land session from the United States through up the end of the 19th century. And that, you know, that is linked to individual treaties and executive orders. And I've used that when I've taught Native American history. Um, but that's a pretty f straightforward representation. And there I encourage students to dig, to find a treaty. Because one of the interesting things about that is that the BIA has this kind of um, fictional vision of what happened. Well, the federal government has this fictional idea that every single square foot was legally ceded to it. And so there's this seamless kind of puzzle if, that blankets the United States, which you know is to make us all sleep soundly and say, oh, well, yeah, that treaty was signed in whatever year, and so-and-so signed it. Um, and that's what the map represents that I put online. People mistake it for fact. So what I encourage students to do is pick one of these treaties and dig into it and just see, like, did they even know where the boundaries were? Because they didn't in most cases. Um, and does, does this boundary actually meet that boundary as they claim that it does? And what were the circumstances under which the treaty was signed? Um, so, but this stuff I haven't actually taught with much yet. I've used some of the uh, um, kind of screenshots of the population just to encourage students to um, visualize that when I'm teaching that US survey class, which I do to 300 students who are not interested in US history because they're, you know, accounting majors, like, you know, this is really important and it's interesting and what you think of as early American history is not really what it is because look, Georgia, you know, to, if I go back to that map of the South, um, Georgia in 17, at the era of the American Revolution was just a sliver of of colonial, of colonists living along the Savannah River and along the coast. I mean, I mean, sliver, like it is just right along the river, like the rest of the state was still indigenous in the era of the American Revolution. So to, you know, to, to convey that to students visually, I can tell them, but I think when they see it, it's just a much more powerful representation. But I'm really looking forward to, to teaching with the other database when it's finally up and running. But I haven't really thought much about the teaching component. And if you have ideas, email me, because I would love to hear them. Any other questions? All right. Well, yeah. Um, one thing that struck me is when you started with the Nazis and all the documentation that they did, which, you know, they did, they documented everything, which was, makes it easier to track. The documentation mm -hmm. there is astounding. Yeah, and that struck me too. Um, and I don't like to push that too far because it's such a different context, but there are these eerie similarities. Um, and, and just, um, you know, uh, on the surface level, like one thing that strikes me is that um, neither of these states, um, both states were convinced they were not committing a crime. So they thought, well, let's, you know, we're going to document all of this because that's what an efficient, and in the, at least in the case of the US, civilized state does. Um, and, and these administrators said that this was going to be the first, I don't remember the exact phrase, but this, you know, it's, this is going to be the first kind of Indian policy which is based on the values of an American republic and is civilized, and we're going to show the rest of the world that we're doing it the right way. So, of course, we're going to doc, you know, we're going to send out all of these agents and document everything um, to my advantage as a historian. But yes, it is bizarre and kind of creepy. And it's also, um, it was extraordinarily intrusive. And so these records, when you go back and read them, occasionally that kind of pops out because the surveyor or evaluator will note at the bottom, so and so refuses to show me their property and says they're not moving, or they'll do what John Ross, the principal chief, tells me. You know, I'll do what John Ross tells me to do. But until then, you know, get out of here. I'm not interested in whatever the federal government 
promises, you know, says it's going to do for me. Um, and so that's apparent in the records. But you can imagine if you're living in a Cherokee community in North Georgia on a small river, um, and some of these you know, some of these communities had very close and, and constant contact with colonists, and they were intermarried as well. But lots of these other communities, they didn't speak English. They didn't see uh, white Jordan, Georgians very frequently. And then you have these people showing up with notebooks, writing down all these things, um, you know, and they'd show up again six months later, and you can imagine how intrusive that was. And so, um, you know, even today, like I, I mentioned, I've been out to Oklahoma numerous times and doing various projects, but yeah, you go to Oklahoma and it's these dirt roads, it's that grid that the surveyors laid down in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and you can drive for miles, and there are these traditional you know, they're Cherokee and Creek communities. And so if I show up there in my rental car and get out with a notebook and knock on some Missouri, which I foolishly have done, um, what do they think? Well, of course, they're suspicious and, you know, it can be quite intrusive if you're not kind of going through family connections and people who know people. So, I mean, you know, I think it's an important part of the story. Yeah, so thank you all for coming.